And here's a phrase that, that came to my mind as I'm studying and preparing for this message this week. The sky's the limit. The sky's the limit. I was thinking about back to 50 years ago on this Sunday. And I was thinking about the walkers and being in their position. I mean, they made a, they made a gigantic move. This, was a, this is not where their family was from. They, they moved here with a young family. They stepped out in faith. And on the second Sunday in July in 1973, they had their very first service as a church with 10 whole people there. 10. And I think three of them, at least three of them, included his family at that time. So seven And I know this, I know that there was far more questions than there was answers, but I believe with every bit of my heart, they came with a great expectancy, not in themselves, but in a God who is able to build a church when there wasn't one there before. And you know what God did? He did exactly that. And as we step into our 51st year, I feel like in many ways, there's a lot of similarities I don't know if you all have noticed, but on this wall in the hallway right behind us, um, for the past couple of years, there has been a master facility plan that is hung there. And on either side of that has been individual pictures and renderings of all of the different projects that needed to be completed. I don't know if you've noticed, but those are all down right now. Part of the reason is we had to paint. But another part of that reason is just about every single thing that was on there has been accomplished. Will you praise the Lord for that? <laughs> Man, I'm, I'm excited about what God's been doing. I was, we were meeting with our, our school board a little over a week ago, and we were just talking about the future. And part of what we need to do in this year and part of what's happening right now is, is reimagining, relooking at even that master facility plan, which is totally outdated because the sky's the limit. What God has done here has already exceeded any of my expectations. I mean, even our school's been growing exponentially. Our church has been. We've been averaging close to 600 people a week this year. God is doing great things. And the potential of what we can do and continue to see God do in this community for his honor and for his glory and the people that can still be reached, it's It's limitless. Not because there's anything great about us, but because there's everything great about our God. And as we step into the 51st year, I can tell you, there's a lot more questions than I have answers right now. But I believe with every bit of my heart that God wants to continue to work and he wants to continue to move. And that's where our expectancy lies. And that leads us perfectly into our message this morning, which is entitled this. What's our defining moment? Give me this mountain. Give me this mountain. I I love the context here. We're in Joshua chapter 14. That's where we're going to start. We're actually going to cover three chapters today. So get ready. Buckle your seatbelts. Now we're going to hit some highlights in three chapters. But in chapters 14 through 21, Joshua is allotting the land to the nine and a half tribes that are going to possess the promised land. So it begins here in Joshua chapter 14. In verses 1 through 6, it lays out that Joshua and the elders of Israel are going to be obedient to what Moses commanded, how he told them to do it. And he said the way to divide up the land was to cast lots. Because in casting of lots, it wasn't a luck thing. It was a God thing. When you cast it, God told them to cast lots. And the way that the lot would fall would be the way that God would want the land to be distributed. So that's the first six verses of chapter 14. That's how it's all setting up. But then you get to verse 7. And we get reintroduced to a man that has not shown up on the scene for about 45 years now. And that man happens to be a man by the name of Caleb. Caleb was one of the original 12 spies that was sent to spy out the land of Canaan. Um, We're going to talk a little bit more about them in just a minute. Only two spies, him and Joshua, believed that God was able to give them the land. And as a result of that... God promised Caleb and Joshua that when they got to the promised land, he had some special land that was theirs. So here in this passage, before anything starts happening, Caleb rises to the occasion. He's not going to miss out on what God's promised him. And in verse 12, he makes an incredibly bold and big ask. Let's read it again out loud, okay? Put it up on the screen. Let's read this one out loud together. All right, you all ready? Now, therefore, give me this mountain, whereof the Lord spake in that day. For thou heardest in that day how the Anakims were there, and that the cities were great and fenced. If so be the Lord will be with me, then I shall be able to drive them out, as the Lord said. 
Man, how many of you would like to have that kind of zeal and spirit? I don't know about you, but man, that's, that's what I... Give me this mountain. Hey, you may have heard back in the day that there's some Anakims, there's some giants up in that mountain. But if the Lord's going to be with me, I'm going to be able to drive them out. That's the piece of land that I want. He wanted Hebron. Hebron was a beautiful, fruitful city. It was at the summit of a a, a chain of mountains. It's 3,000 feet above sea level. How many of you love to stand at the top of a mountain and get an unbelievable view of what lies below you? There's nothing like it. It's amazing. It's a beautiful, fruitful area, but it was also the most daunting region in all of the land of Canaan. At the top of this mountain, 3,000 feet above sea level, is a walled city. And guess who lives inside the walled city? Not just ordinary people, but giants, real giants, powerful giants. A giant by the name of Anak, who had three really powerful sons. And it was an area that had already been conquered, but yet people still went back to this fortress. And for Caleb to go be able to possess that land, there was still work that had to be done. And Caleb looks at that daunting area and he says, I want that mountain. Give me this mountain. I'll tell you what, as we as a church are celebrating our past and as we're looking to our future, there's no better attitude that we could have than that same bold, zealous faith in God. God, give me this mountain. Let's look at some of the things that we can learn from this chapter that are laid out. If we're going to make a A big ask like that, it requires, number one, conviction that cries. It requires conviction that cries. Look at chapter 14, verse 6 with me, okay? I I just want you to see again Caleb's spirit. It says here in verse 6, Then the children of Judah came unto Joshua in Gilgal. And Caleb the son of Jephunneh the Kenezite said unto him, Thou knowest the thing that the Lord said unto Moses, the man of God, concerning me and thee in Kadesh Barnea. I just love the fact that Caleb was a man of conviction, and that conviction led him to action. And for 45 years now, he had been sitting and longing and waiting for the land that was promised to him by God. And he wasn't going to sit on the sidelines and let him pass it by. He steps up. He takes action. It's at the very beginning. I mean, they're just now going to start. And guess who's there knocking on the door saying, hey, Joshua, Remember that promise that God made to you and me 45 years ago? Well, guess what? I know what land I want. Give me this mountain, man. He's a man of conviction, and conviction leads him to action. And that conviction and passion, I I say that it had been there in his life for at least 45 years, but I believe that it probably had been in his life all his life. For some reason, he was chosen as one of the 12 spies from the tribe of Judah that goes out. And to put this into context... We got to go back to what happened 45 years earlier. Now, we've already talked about Caleb was one of the original 12 spies that Moses sent into the promised land. I was reminded all week long about a song that I learned way back in the day when I was a child a long time ago. I had a birthday yesterday, 43. I'm getting so old, but a long time ago when I was in junior church, and it went like this, 12 men went to spy out Canaan. Ten were bad and two were good. What do you think they saw in Canaan? You're getting there. Some saw giants big and strong. Some saw grapes in clusters long, and then you hold it out for a really long time. Some saw God was in it all. Ten were. Y'all aren't in the singing mood today, are you? Y'all are tired out. Brock's ready to sing. Anyway, ten were bad and two were good. Okay, it, they went into the land. They come back in Numbers chapter 13. They come back from their expedition. They are giving their account in front of all of the people and the 10 bad spies, the 10 spies who had little faith. They're standing before the people and they're saying, everything that God told us about the promised land is true. It's a land that flows with milk and honey. There are grapes and clusters long. Trust me, it's a beautiful land. But guess what? The people and the cities are greater than we're able to take. We should not cross the Jordan River. We should not go into the promised land. And you know what Caleb does instantly, immediately? Put Numbers 13 verse 30 up on the screen. Look at this verse. I mean, this whole debate is going down and these 10 people are starting to win the day. And Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, let us go up 
Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. I mean, you got to put yourself in this moment. Guess what? So Caleb, he's, his conviction's crying out. He believes in who God is and that God's able to give them the land. Well, guess what? The other 10 people, the other 10 spies, they were people with conviction too. They just had the wrong conviction. They had a bad conviction, a conviction that will lead to a life that will fall so far short of everything that God intends for you to have. Because you know what they said? Oh, man, they, they said, we're not able to go up against them. They are stronger than we are. They actually said, we're just like little grasshoppers before their eyes. And you know what? The people, they, they, the people, they started mourning, and they, they rent their clothes, and it says in the Bible that they wept all night. They planned a mutiny. They were going to overthrow Moses and Aaron. They were going to pick a new captain that would lead them back to Egypt, that would lead them back to slavery, that would lead them back to nowhere, a life of complacency that they hated before because they were scared of the giants and the walled cities. And you know what? Caleb and Joshua, they speak up one more time in chapter 14. They say, don't rebel against the Lord. Don't fear the enemy. I love Caleb's spirit. They are bread for us. You said we're like grasshoppers to them. They're bread for us. They're nothing. The Lord is with us. Let us go up. But we know what happened. The people listened to the 10 spies. And as a result, for the next 40 years, the children of Israel had to wander around in the wilderness, and everybody from that generation except for Caleb and Joshua lost their life. You know what the practical application is for all of us here this morning? We need to seize the promise. We need to seize the promise. Caleb's conviction spoke loud and clear. If God said it, let's go get it at once. There's no reason to wait. If God's given us this promise and if God's given us the land and it's time, then let us go up at once and let us possess it. I love that type of eagerness and that type of zeal. You know, we're only given one day at a time. Our life is a vapor. It appears for a time and vanishes away. We don't know how much more time we have left. We don't know how many days of life God's going to bless us with. Let us go up at once and seize the promises of God and lay hold of them. Here's the reality. You either have Conviction that cries out to the greatness of God, or you don't. That's it. We're either people of conviction, and our conviction cries out relentlessly, loudly, that our God is great, and our God is able, and nothing shall be impossible with God, or we don't have it. And we miss out on seeing God move and work. There's a great, great quote that rings often in my mind. Whether you believe you can or you believe you can't, you're right. And when it comes to the things of God, whether you believe he's, he's not big enough and able to handle the giants and the obstacles that are in your way, you're right. Stay there. Or you can believe that our God is able and our God is greater and he put us in this world for a reason. And when you get a hold of faith in who he is, he can. He can move mountains. He can part the waters. He can do a work that can only be attributed to him. Seize the promise. Have you ever heard of the silver rule? Has anybody ever heard of the silver rule? I I like to listen to the verse of the day on my Bible app and uh, man, I learned a lot of neat little things from that. And earlier this week, they were talking about the golden rule, but he set that up with the silver rule. The silver, the, silver, the silver rule predates all the way back into the B.C. times. It's a rule that's been around for a long time. Go ahead and put it up on the screen. Here's the silver rule. This is what it says. Do not do unto others as you would not have them do unto you. How many of you believe that's a pretty fair rule as far as rules go? It's not a bad rule. I mean, if you're being honest, we've all been there before. Have you ever told your children, keep your hands to yourself? Have you ever told your kids, don't go near that person at school, because if you do, it's just going to stir up problems. So stay away. Don't do to them what you don't want them to do to you. Has anybody ever been guilty of? That's a rule that, that makes a lot of sense often in life. It's not a bad rule. Don't do unto others what you don't want them to do unto you. But you know the problem with this rule is that it's passive. The problem with this rule is it allows us to not engage with other people. It allows us to just kind of stay in our own comfort zones and in our own little bubbles. You know what the golden rule says? Jesus comes along and he 
takes that silver rule and he turns it upside down just like he does with everything else in life. And the golden rule in Matthew 7, 12, go ahead and put that up here. Here's what the golden rule says. Everybody, let's read this one out loud together. All things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them. You know what he's, he, he turns this thing around. Don't leave other people alone. All things that you would that men should do unto you, do to them. Get off your seats. Get in the game. You don't get to just go through life and coast in your own little bubble and in your own little world, just ignoring and not creating problems. No, Jesus has called us to step out of our comfort zones and to engage the world and to step into the fight and to do, to do unto others as you would have them do unto you. There's so many different ways I can go with this. I believe with all my heart that the greatest need that our world has today, and I'm burdened about America today. Of course, it's, our, it's, it's the celebration of our independence and all that God has blessed us with. And I'm burdened about our country. And I'm, I'm sad for our country. I believe that our country is in desperate need of God. And I'm sad for, I'm sad for people that they're falling for lies that lead nowhere. And you know what? We have the hope that can be found in Jesus. And you know what the Bible tells us? That Jesus is the Lamb of God that came to take away the sins of this world. Do you know the conviction that cries? Do you know the promise that we need to seize? Is that Jesus Christ truly is the living hope of this world. And when we lift high his name, and when we tell people in their brokenness, and in their sin, and in their shame, and in their hurt, and in their despair, when we tell them that there's hope in Jesus, and that he can forgive, and he can give life, and he can heal, and he can save, and he's everything that you're looking for. He takes away the sin. He takes away the burden. He takes away the pain. God, give us the conviction that cries out to the greatness of who our God is. Let's lift his name high. Let's preach the gospel of the good news of Jesus Christ because he still saves and he's still moving and he's still working. And I don't believe that we should ever stop until the day that he calls us home. We gotta have a conviction that cries. Do we have it? Do we have it? Secondly, I want us to see from this text, if we're gonna make an ask like that, it requires strength that stands. It requires strength that stands. Look at verses 10 and 11. Joshua chapter 14. I need to run more. That got me out of breath right there. I'm trying to like just slowly but surely catch it back. Here we go. And now behold, the Lord hath kept me alive, as he said these 40 and 5 years, even since the Lord spake this word unto Moses, while the children of Israel wandered in the wilderness. And now, lo, I am this day fourscore and five years old. How old is Caleb? He's 85 years old. Hey, last week we were talking to our older people, our people that were old and stricken in age. Here's a man that's old and stricken in age, but look at his spirit. Look at his vigor. Look at the energy that's still in him. Look at verse 11. He says, as yet I am as strong this day as I was in that day that Moses sent me. As my strength was then, even so is my strength now for war, but to go out and to come in. All I got to say is, wow. That's amazing. It's amazing when you consider the context of Caleb in his life too. Remember the whole scene that we unfolded in point number one. He's up there and he's convincing the people. No, God's given us this land. Let's go take the land. Remember that scene? Guess what the people wanted to do to him and Joshua? Stone him. They got, it got so intense in the fight. And Caleb and Joshua were so passionate. The people said, let's take those two and stone them. Because all they're trying to do is get us killed. Well, guess what happened? Put yourself in Caleb's shoes for the next 40 years of his life, he had to wander around in the wilderness with the very people that put him there. How many of you think that would be a really good recipe to be done with people in general? To maybe get a little bit of bitterness creeping into your heart and soul? Maybe even get angry at God. God, why do I have to stay with these people? I'll go take that land myself. Get me away from these dreaded human beings that I have to do life with. 
I mean, I just, I'm just, again, this is, these are real live human beings. This is people. And for 45 years, 40 years in the wilderness, seven years taken over the, or close to 40 years, but seven years taken over the land. He's been waiting for this moment, and he gets to the end of it at 85 years old, and he's just as zealous as he was before. And his strength has not waned, and his faith has not waned, and he survived every single bit of that. Wow. Here's the practical application that I want to give you from this. Dare to be different. Dare to be different. You know, mountains are a force of power. I I like this too. Give me this mountain. Mountains are a force of power. You ever just look at mountains and you're just like, whoa. The rugged beauty of who God is, man. Just, I mean, you have the rolling hills of just the beautiful smoky mountains, but you get out to the rocky mountains and it's just like strength and power. Did you know that earliest civilizations consider them to be the edge of civilization because they were unpassable? Impassable. You know what most human beings do? Most human beings look at a mountain and say, I'm not climbing that thing. That's impossible. I'm just done. And that's the edge. That's it. And, and we don't take the risk. But every now and then, there's somebody that looks at that mountain and says, give me that mountain. I'm climbing to the top. I'm taking this mountain. That's, that's the kind of guy that Caleb was. Well, the Bible illustrates both of these perfectly. Joshua 14. You might be wondering, why are we going from chapter 14 to 17? What are the highlights today? Joshua through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, as he's writing his account, starts with an incredible account of faith with Caleb, who's daring to be different. He says, give me this mountain. And he closes the first section of the distribution of the land in chapter 17 with the exact opposite account. So chapters, these four chapters, they go together. And Joshua is giving out the land to the children of Judah and to the children of Joseph. Joseph received a double blessing from the Lord. So his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, they both get some land in the promised land. They both get their own land in the promised land. When he's done distributing the land, they come to Joshua in chapter 17 and they say, Joshua, we are a great people. How many of you think that's a bad way to start off anything right there? I am great. (laughs) That's how they start. Joshua, we're a great people and you didn't give us enough land. You got to turn to Joshua 17. You got to look at this. This is so good. Look at verse 15. This is how Joshua responds to them. And Joshua answered them, If thou be a great people, then get thee up to the wood country and cut down for thyself there in the land of the Perizzites and of the giants, if Mount Ephraim be too narrow for thee. Joshua just turns back, hey, you've got enough land. Sure, you've got Mount Ephraim already, but I've got a whole other mountain. I've got this whole other section of land. Go up there, cut down the wood. Go get the giants. Have the same spirit that Caleb had. Look at their response. And the children of Joseph said, the hill is not enough for us. Okay, is that really the case, or is what comes next the case? And all of the Canaanites that dwell in the land of the valley have chariots of iron, both they who are of Bashin and her towns and they who are of the valley of Jezreel. And Joshua spake unto the house of Joseph, even to Ephraim and to Manasseh, saying, Thou art a great people and hast great power. Thou shalt not have one lot only, but the mountain shall be thine, for it is wood, and thou shalt cut it down, and the outgoings of it shall be thine, for thou shalt drive out the Canaanites, though they have iron chariots and though they be strong. But guess what never happens? They don't do it. They don't take the land. This is the crowd. There's only a few that dare to be different that actually step out from the crowd. Most people look at the mountain and they say, it's too daunting, the task is too great. Very few people dare to be different. Very few people step out and said, if God's in it, then that mountain is mine and I'm going to take it. Very few people have the conquering spirit that Caleb had. And a whole lot of people have the spirit that the entire sons of Joseph had. And they never go up, even though they were a great people. And they never conquer because the enemy seemed too great. You know what I love about Caleb? Numbers 14, 24 tells us that Caleb had another spirit within him. He was different from everybody else. You know what? The majority had great giants and a little God. But Caleb and Joshua, they had a great God and little giants. Dare to be different. Do you know what his ultimate motivation was? I was talking at the beginning of the message about Hebron. Here's Caleb's ultimate motivation. Uh, I love when the Bible, man, the Bible is a beautiful, beautiful book. I love studying it. There's so much truth and so many nuggets here. Hebron. Hebron's a very important city in the Old Testament. Do you know 
that back in Genesis chapter 13, after Lot and Abraham separated and Lot chose the better land, do you know where Abraham ended up? He ended up at the top of Mount Hebron. And at the top of Mount Hebron, God says to Abraham, he says, Abraham, look all around you. Look at the entire land. Don't worry about what Lot just did. All of it is yours At the top of Mount Hebron, God spoke with Abraham face to face. When Abraham came back to the land, he inhabited that part and he bought the cave of Machpelah and that's where Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Sarah were all buried. Later on, when David becomes the king, when he initially becomes the king and the rebellion against Saul is taken care of, for the first seven years, the capital city is in Hebron. Caleb ends up giving the city of Hebron to the Levites and God uses it as a city of refuge where people who are in desperate need of mercy can go find mercy and can go find grace. Do you know what it was that Caleb wanted more than anything else? He wanted God. That word Hebron means fellowship, communion. It wasn't about the land that flowed with milk and honey. It wasn't about the grapes and clusters long. It was about a God who he wanted to know more intimately, who he wanted to know more fully. It was about a God who delivers on his promises over and over again. Don't ever forget when we dare to be different, when we dare to step out from the crowd, when we look at the giants and the obstacles that are in our way and we take that step of faith, do you know who you're gonna encounter? You're gonna encounter a God who is able face to face and he's gonna meet with you and there's gonna be fellowship and there's gonna be communion and there's gonna be a deeper relationship with God than you could ever possibly imagine. Keep your eye on the prize. We dare to be different, not because we're trying to build our own legacy, but because we want the world to know how great our God is. Do you want the world to know how great our God is? Do you want to know the lengths and breadth and depth and height of his love and the greatness of his power? Do you want to know that? If you do, then dare to be different and step out of the comfort zone and engage this world for the cause of Christ. And last, I want you to see If we're going to make an ask like that, it requires faith that finishes. Chapter 15 tells us the rest of the story. (laughs) Not only does he ask for the mountain, but guess what? He goes and he takes the mountain. And chapter 15 tells us, and I'm not going to read all the verses. I'll read a couple here in just a minute. But there's um, three sons of Anak mentioned there. Anak is the king of the giants, okay? I mean, this this is Hercules himself. And Hercules had three sons, and these three sons are mentioned by name three different times in the Bible, not because they were the only giants that were in the land, but these were the legends of the giants. These were the giants of the giants, the best of the best, the baddest of the bad, the toughest of the tough, whatever the case may be. And he goes up there, and he takes those three giants, and they were like grasshoppers to him. They were nothing, not because of him, but because of his God. And he takes the city, and he takes the region, and he finishes what he started. And Caleb ends his life, and he steps into glory. And I believe he hears those words, well done, thou good and faithful servant, because God did some incredible things in his life. But here is an awesome little nugget, too. Not only did he finish, but you know what happens when we finish? He doesn't just finish, but he passes his faith on. If you're in chapter 15, look at verses 15 and 16. This is so good. And he went up thence to the inhabitants of Deber, and the name of Deber was Kerjath Sefer. And Caleb said, He that smiteth Kerjath Sefer and taketh it to him will I give Aixa, my daughter, to wife. So Caleb's like, Okay, I've taken this city, I've got a daughter, she's a beautiful daughter. I want to find a man who is worthy of my daughter. By the way, who is a man that would be worthy of a guy like Caleb's daughter? How would you like to go up and ask that guy if you could marry his daughter? I mean, I guarantee you that. I remember when I asked her dad if I could marry her, I was intimidated. That's a pretty scary thing. I'm asking for his only daughter's hand in marriage. I mean, I felt the weight of that. And guess what? I took him to a restaurant that only took cash, and I didn't have cash, and he had to pay for it, too. Talk about a guy that makes mistakes all the time. (laughs) She whiz. I mean, this is the only thing that makes sense. If you want to marry my daughter, go get that city. Go get that giants. Guess who steps up to the scene? Othniel. Othniel's like, okay, your daughter's beautiful. My God's great. That city's nothing. And he goes out there and he conquers the city. Then his daughter comes along and she's not satisfied. Look what she says. Not with the man. It's nothing about the man. 
But she says um, in verse 18, And it came to pass, as she came unto him, that she moved him to ask her father a field. And she lighted off her ass, and Caleb said unto her, What wouldest thou? Who answered, Give me a blessing, for thou hast given me a south land. Give me also springs of water. And he gave her the upper springs and the nether springs. Now, if you're just casually reading through this, you might say, Man, she might be a little bit of an entitled daughter. I don't see it that way at all. I see that this is a woman that is full of faith, just like her now husband and just like her dad, because not only did she see what she was being given, but she saw that God has more. Last week we prayed the prayer of Jabez. God bless me. God enlarge my coast. Continue to grow me. And I believe that she had that type of conquering spirit and that type of attitude. And you know who Othniel was? If you go to the book of Judges, it didn't take long after Joshua died before an enemy comes in. And Othniel is the very first judge of Israel. And they call up a man who had faith. They call up the next generation. They say, Othniel, we know you got faith. Come save us. And he delivers the children of Israel out of the land. And then he goes on to rule and reign for 40 years. And God blessed the children of Israel all through that time. You know what Caleb's faith did? Caleb didn't just finish because he finished. He put a zeal and a spark in the next generation to continue to follow in those same steps and to continue to press on. What's our practical application here? Never stop. Never stop. How do you get to be 85 years old and not lose strength? You know what's said about Caleb six different times in the Bible? He followed me fully. He followed me fully. He followed me fully. He followed me with his whole heart, his whole soul, his whole mind, his whole strength. Whatever it was that God said, he was all in and he had faith. And he did that every single day of his life. And he never stopped. Man, as we think about year number 51 as a church... And as we think about the future, our attitude has to be, we've got to have a faith that finishes and we've got to inspire the next generation and we can never stop. I think about this property out here and there's a lot of land that still needs to be developed. When do we get to the point where we're just like, that's enough, God. You gave us 700 kids in our school. That's all we can handle. I don't want, how do we do that? How do we get to the point as a church where we're just like, we got enough to go forward, it's hard work. I don't know all the answers. Listen, we don't just continue to move forward so we can build new buildings and we can have a nice property and enjoy our life. We continue to move forward because every single person is a soul that was created in the image and likeness of God. And every single human being is a person that needs to know who God is and how to have a relationship with him. And I don't believe we as Christians can ever get to the point where we're just like, that's it, that's enough. No, we've got to continue to press forward to the mark of the prize of the high calling of God. God in Christ Jesus and whatever it is that he wants to continue to bless us with. That's what we're after. That's what we pursue. I, I want to close just with the title of the message. Give me this mountain. Give me this mountain. When we went on the senior trip uh, a couple months ago, we went to Colorado and we had the opportunity to take the Cog Railway to the top of Pikes Peak. Now, when Miss Bacon and I, when Miss Bacon was planning the trip, she asked me some things along the way. She told me, she's like, I'm not sure if I want to go to Pikes Peak. I've been there before. It's, it's really cold up there. You can't breathe up there. And the more she talked, I was like, you can't breathe up there? We're going. We got to go to the top of this mountain. I mean, you're making it sound awesome. You're not making it sound not appealing. I want to go to the top of this mountain. So, you know, we did. We went to the top of the mountain. And uh, on the way up, it's an unbelievable ride on the Cog Railway. And, uh, man, you start in the woods, and then you eventually get above the timber line, and the tour guide tells you all these crazy, amazing stories, like this one young couple that had gotten married, and they were out there on their honeymoon, and they were hiking to the top of Pikes Peak, and the last train of the day was leaving, and they stopped, and they told the people, there's a bad storm that's coming on the way. Get on the train, and they're like, no, we'll be fine. And they're like, no, a bad storm's about to come. Get on the train. It's in, they're like, it's August. We'll be fine. And he's like, no, get on the train. They're like, no, we'll be fine. Guess what happened? The next day, they get up. They take the train to the top of the mountain, and the two people, the couple, are frozen to death on the side of the railroad tracks. And you know what? They, they told the story about how they reached into the guy's coat pocket, and they took out a note from one of their parents, and it said, have a great time on your honeymoon. Don't freeze to death. And then they said, down in the gift shop, we have a picture of this couple frozen to death. And I'm like, what is this ride? Where are we going? This is 2023. You don't talk about stuff like that in public. 
let alone have the picture. In the gift. I went to the gift shop, and they have the picture. I showed it to everybody. I was like, they, they weren't lying. This was a real story, I guess. I don't know. We get to the top. It's uh, April. It was like 50 degrees down below. It was like 18 degrees. It was the Arctic tundra. We got out. You can't breathe. We're from Florida. You don't want to stand. The wind is blowing strong. I'm trying to enjoy the beauty of God's creation. I'm like, it's cold. We ran inside the gift shop. Guess what? At the top of this mountain, 14,000 feet above sea level in the Arctic tundra in the middle of Colorado, there's this amazing gift shop. You can, you can use the restroom up there. You can buy coffee. You can eat donuts. You can get a sandwich at the top of the mountain because someone along the line looked at that mountain and said, I want that mountain. It started with a man by the name of General Montgomery Zebulon Pike. He was not successful, but 10 years later, a man by the name of Edwin James was successful, the first one to summit the peak in 1820. And it wasn't long before people realized the pure majesty and beauty of the top of that mountain. And they started giving really rich people rides up there on donkeys. And then they started giving people rides up there on carriages. And then they built the railroad. And they told us another really incredible story about a lady by the name of Catherine Lee Bates. She was a professor, poet, and writer. And in the late 1800s, she rides to the top of Pikes Peak, America's mountain. And when she gets to the top, she's just overwhelmed at the sheer beauty. And by the way, it is magnificent. If you are ever in Colorado, take the Cog Railroad. Drink a lot of water, not too much. Ask Greg Pryor about that. <laughs> Don't drink too much water, but drink a lot of water like they tell you to do. Take the Cog Railway. It is absolutely worth the time. And she wrote a very famous poem that was put to music, America the Beautiful. And it says, Oh, beautiful for spacious skies, for amber waves of grain, from purple mountains' majesty above the fruited plains. The Pikes Peak is known as the Purple Mountain. And they're up there at the top. I mean, all the Colorado Rockies are like the Purple Mountains, but from Purple Mountains' majesty. And when you're up there and you're looking out, you are above the fruited plains. I mean, that song just came to life to me in a way that was, it never had before because I didn't know that story. And here I am standing at the very peak and I'm looking out and I see, I see God's greatness. I see God's beauty. I, I think about our country. I think about how God has blessed us and how good God has been to us. God truly has shed his grace on thee. And I think about our, our, our country and we do have a desperate need for God. And you know what? I don't know what all the answers are, but I know what our answer is. I know that God has put us right here at 5621 Highway 90, and he's placed us in the center of Pace in Milton, Florida. And I believe with every bit of my heart that God still wants to work, and God still wants to move. And I believe with every bit of my heart that he wants to make this property and this church and this place a monument to his name for his honor and for his glory. And as I think about all that still needs to get done, I can tell you it's overwhelming. We actually have a mountain on our property. We might be the highest place in all of Florida right now with that big giant pile of dirt in the back. And you know what? I want it gone. I want it gone. I want it to be buildings and fields and everything that we envision this property to be. Why? Because I want to continue to reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I can tell you, it feels big and it feels daunting and it feels overwhelming. But as we step into year number 51, God, give me this mountain. God, give us this mountain. Give us this church. Give us this community. Give us people who we can steal back from the snatches of Satan, who can be saved and transformed and given the hope that's found in Jesus Christ. God, that's what we're after. That's what we want. That's what it's all about. God, help us to dare to be different. Help us not to become complacent. Help us not to give up striving for more of what God wants to pour out onto our lives. Give us this mountain.